Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here, continuing our lectures on the urinary system. Today we're going to get into the actual physiology of the nephron, which is creating the urine for us. Before we get started though, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that this is our second to last unit, so urinary system, and then next we'll do reproductive system, and then we have a small amount of time to do some review before your final exams. So uh, we've covered a lot of ground in this course, so it's a good idea to start reflecting back on some of the things that we learned early in the semester and to work out a study plan where you will review each topic at least two or three times over the course of the next few weeks, right? So multiple repeated exposures over time, as we know, are the keys to learning and retaining information. So now is a good time to work out that study plan. Okay, so at the end of our previous lecture, one of the things we talked about was what is urine. So let's just remind ourselves. So urine is made by the kidneys and it's where we put all of the stuff that we don't need or want. So wastes are going to be in the urine, right? We're gonna eliminate wastes such as urea, creatinine, uric acid, and ammonia. Urine also contains a lot of water because it allows us to get rid of those solutes, right, by dissolving them in water. And it also allows us to regulate our total body water. So really important for overall fluid homeostasis. And we can also change vo water volume in our body as a way to help adjust and regulate blood pressure and blood volume as well. We're also going to excrete hydrogen ions or acid if we need to in order to help maintain normal pH of our bloodstream. And then there is also going to be sodium, potassium, calcium, and other electrolytes in the urine so that we can regulate exactly what the concentrations of those things in our bloodstream are, right? So if you eat a really salty meal, you're going to end up peeing out more salt than you usually do because it's more sodium than you need. Sodium is also very osmotically active. It is the electrolyte that is in the highest concentration in our bloodstream, right? We are salt water animals, basically on the inside. And so we also use sodium levels to help regulate our total blood volume and therefore blood pressure because of its osmotic activity. So I also introduced you to the nephron last time. So we have over a million of these microscopic arrangements of blood vessels that run in tandem with tubules. And those tubules are carrying the filtrate, which is kind of the baby urine. And so we have this process whereby we can move things out of the bloodstream into the filtrate, which will become the urine, and that's how the kidneys do their job. Now, in order to do that, there's a series of four main jobs that the nephron is going to do. So let's talk about exactly what those are and how the nephron does it. So the four main jobs that the nephron is going to do are filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and water balance or water conservation, sometimes also called water reabsorption, <laughs> okay? So we're gonna talk about each of these four jobs in turn today. Let's start with filtration. This is job number one. We'll start with a case, and this is actually based off of a case that I saw in a college student. So th these things are real, they do actually happen, and understanding how the kidneys work actually helps you to figure out what's going on with your patient. So her name wasn't really Glenda, but I just picked that for this case, and that's not really her picture, that's a stock photo. All right, so uh, Glenda just noticed that her urine is a really strange color. It almost looks like cola kind of colored, almost like a Dr. Pepper, Mr. Pibb, um, but not quite that dark. And she's also getting some swelling in her lower legs. Now, what's interesting is that this patient first saw a colleague of mine, a nurse practitioner, and she had been out working in the campus garden uh, for a couple days in a row. She was on her feet a lot and she thought, well, maybe I'm just dehydrated and I've been spending too many hours on my feet and kind of squatting in the, in the garden to pull weeds and things. And that's why I have the swelling in the lower legs. 
And my colleague just happened to kind of mention this case to me. And I was like, oh my goodness, no, we need to test her urine. And so we did. And it turned out she had a problem with her glomeruli. And let me just show you a few images, right? So this is what the urine would typically look like in a case like this. And this is the swelling in the legs, that edema, right, from XS excess fluid. And so you can kind of see here the indentation, oh that color doesn't show up very well, uh, from their socks, right, or from their sweatpant legs because the, the tissues are all puffy with excess fluid. So now we're going to talk about what the glomerulus does and why this caused this problem for Glenda. So the glomerulus is where filtration happens. So the glomerulus is a ball of capillaries. So if you'll recall our flow of blood, it comes in through the afferent arteriole, moves into this nest of capillaries. They've simplified it here, but it's this little ball of capillaries and then moves out through the efferent arteriole. So in the glomerulus, filtr filtration is going to occur. Over here on the right, this is a microscopic image, right? So this is looking through the microscope. Here is our ball of capillaries. And then this is Bowman's capsule surrounding it, kind of like a cup, all right? So remember the path of blood flow, right? From renal artery to smaller arteries to the afferent arterial into the glomerular capillaries and then out the efferent arterial, right? So this is where filtration is happening. So we have to talk about what filtration actually means. And I apologize, I didn't animate everything correctly, but I'm gonna use a French press coffee maker to illustrate the process of filtration. So if you've never made coffee in a French press, I will explain it to you. For those of you who have, you can feel free to fast forward through this part. So you have a canister with a plunger, basically, that has this filter on it. So it's usually a metal mesh screen, very fine screen you can't really see the holes in that screen but it's like a really fine sieve and what you do is you pour in your coffee grounds into your container and then you pour in your hot water right so now you have this solution of these gritty coffee grounds in your hot water which is brewing coffee for you and then after it's sat long enough to brew what you're gonna do is put take that plunger, right, and you're gonna push it down. And so what's going to happen is that only water and the smallest solutes, the delicious coffee molecules, will be able to be up here because all of the large, gritty coffee grounds are gonna be down here. So this is a sorting out of particles according to size. The things that were small enough to go through the filter, right, so now it's making sense, things that are small enough to go through the filter are going to end up in your filtrate, your delicious coffee, <laughs> right? But the things that are large are going to stay behind in this kind of slurry of coffee grounds. So this is the process of filtration, sorting out of particles according to size using a filter. So in the case of the glomerulus, our filter is our capillary wall. So it's the glomerular capillary wall. And so as you know, only small solutes and water can move across a capillary wall. And so kind of represented by these yellow guys here, so they're gonna move across the capillary wall into Bowman's capsule to form the filtrate. So small molecules that can move across would be things like sodium and potassium and calcium, glucose, amino acids, urea, ammonia, hydrogen ions, and creatinine. All of these things are going to move across into the filtrate. Large substances that are too big to fit through the glomerular capillary wall are going to stay behind in the blood. So that's going to be our formed elements, our erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets, as well as our plasma proteins. Proteins are pretty large, right? Amino acids are small. They're the building blocks of proteins, but plasma proteins are relatively large. So albumin, fibrinogen, our globulins, which are our antibodies, are all going to stay behind in the blood. 
So in order to push this out, right, so kind of the equivalent of pushing that plunger down in your French press coffee maker, we need to generate a filtration pressure. And that is the whole reason why we have arterioles on each side, right? So we can constrict those or dilate those to adjust the pressure, the filtration pressure just right so that we squeeze out that filtrate, so that we squeeze out that water with the small solutes, just as if you were kind of wringing out a washcloth, right? We have to give it a little pressure, or pushing down that plunger on your French press. The other thing I want to point out is that not all of your solutes move across. So when filtration occurs, it's just simply due to the pressure that's being created by those arterioles. And so things that are small enough to move across will, but not every single little thing, right? You're not completely wringing out the washcloth, so to speak. You're not completely pushing that filter all the way to the bottom. Or even if you did, there's still going to be some small molecules that stay behind, right? When they're not going to move against their concentration gradient. There's no carrier proteins doing active transport when we do filtration. So some waste products like creatinine, urea, and ammonia are still left behind in the blood. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind because it's going to be important when we get to the second half of this lecture. All right, so during filtration, some of the plasma and small molecules move out of the capillaries into Bowman's capsule where they become the filtrate or the baby urine. And then normally, large things like our erythrocytes, leukocytes, platelets, and plasma proteins are too large, and they stay behind in the blood and then travel out through the efferent arterial. They stay in the bloodstream. So what happened with poor Glenda, right? So if the glomerulus gets inflamed or infected or irritated, oftentimes as part of the inflammatory response, the capillaries in the glomerulus become very leaky. So if they become leaky and more porous, you have to say to yourself, what would then escape into the filtrate or the urine? So take a moment. And the answer, of course, is those large things that can't otherwise move across into the filtrate. So those plasma proteins like albumin, those formed elements of the blood like erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. So when we think about how this could be diagnosed, we can actually diagnose this by looking at the urine. And that's what we did in this patient's case, right? So we did a urine test. And on the urine test, we were able to see oh, there are red blood cells in here. Now, certainly, if you had a bladder infection, as we talked about last time, that's causing irritation and small uh, little bleeds in the lining of the bladder, that can also cause blood cells to be present in the urine. So that doesn't completely tell us what's going on. But the one thing that would be different in this case is that we would also see a lot of protein, particularly albumin, shows up leaking into the urine. That is not normal. That should never happen if your glomerular capillaries are healthy. So what happens in the body is that certainly you're losing some of your formed elements of your blood, but you're also losing your plasma proteins, particularly albumin is the one that ends up causing trouble. So as we've talked about before, when we've talked about edema and we've talked about those two conflicting pressures in the capillary bed of our regular tissues, we've talked about the osmotic pressure inside blood, largely due to al the presence of albumin versus the hydrostatic pressure, right? So if you don't have enough albumin, your osmotic pressure is too low and more fluid is gonna move out into the tissues as a result of hydrostatic pressure and not be pulled back in. So for Glenda, her glomerular capillaries were too leaky and so blood cells and plasma proteins leaked out into the filtrate and into the urine and were peed out. That is why her urine turned that reddish strange color and that is why she developed edema because her blood albumin levels were too low. So in this particular patient, the urine really told us what was going on and then we did some blood tests to confirm our suspicion, right? And to find out that yes, her plasma albumin was low and we also did some tests that helped us identify that the particular cause in her case of the inflammation of her 
Asperger glomeruli was from a disease called lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. And then we got her treatment and then everything got better, right? So you need to use, put your thinking cap on. All right, let's talk about job number two of the nephron. We're gonna talk about reabsorption. So we're gonna use Reba as our case. She happens to have diabetes. And so diabetes is a condition where the amount of glucose in your bloodstream gets abnormally high. There are two different types of diabetes, type one and type two. And depending on which type you have, the reason for the high blood glucose is a little bit different. But in all cases of diabetes mellitus, which is its full name, you have too high of a blood sugar. So she happens to test her urine in lab and she finds that there's glucose in her urine. And she's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Glucose is not a waste product. Glucose is not something that my body should want to get rid of. It's a nutrient, right? Why isn't my body holding on to this nutrient? Why am I peeing it out? Well, it has to do with reabsorption. <laughs> So reabsorption occurs in the tubules, primarily in that proximal convoluted tubule. And so what happens, remember, some of the molecules, right, some of those small molecules that moved out into the filtrate are things that we don't want to lose from our body. Things like glucose, amino acids, and sodium. Right? They moved across because they were small, but we don't want to pee them out of our body, right? Those are nutrients that we worked hard to get through our digestive system, right? We don't want to just pee them out. So what we're going to do is we're going to reabsorb them from the filtrate into the blood. So this little animation that's playing here, um, and I'm sorry, then I photoshopped some additional things on it that aren't the same colors, but what you can see is these solutes are moving into the filtrate and then getting reabsorbed from the filtrate into the peritubular capillaries. So sodium, amino acids, and glucose, we're going to say, oh wait, no, I didn't want to excrete those from my body, so I'm going to pull them from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. So reabsorption is the movement of solutes from the filtrate back into the blood. So that's really important to kind of get that concept. And so we're gonna do that for things that we don't want to pee out, glucose, amino acids, and sodium. So a few caveats. Glucose and amino acids are nutrients, they are pressures, precious to us. So we want to reabsorb all of it, right? We wanna pull all of the glucose and amino acids out of the filtrate and put it back into the bloodstream. Obviously then we're working against its concentration gradient, right? Cause we're wanting it all to be in one compartment and none in the other. So that is going to take energy. Right? So this is going to be active transport. It's going to require ATP because we want to get all of it out of the urine. Anytime you have active transport, you need a carrier protein to do the job. Right? You need something that's actually going to take a molecule of ATP and use that to then move the solute against its concentration gradient. Most of the time, there are plenty of these carrier proteins present in our proximal convoluted tubule so that we can reabsorb all of the glucose and all of the amino acids back into our blood in those peritubular capillaries. However, if you have a ton of glucose in your blood and therefore a ton of glucose ends up in your filtrate, sometimes then you don't have enough protein carrier molecules and the glucose gets lost in the urine because you just can't, you don't have enough carrier molecules to move it back into the bloodstream quickly enough as it's moving through. So my favorite video to illustrate this problem is from a very old television show called I Love Lucy. And this is a scene, I'm gonna have you watch it. Um, and Lucy and Ethel kind of represent the carrier proteins. And what you'll see is the amount of glucose coming down in the filtrate just completely overwhelms them. And so they can't reabsorb it all. And some of the glucose therefore gets lost in the urine. So do take some time to watch that, it's worth it. So for Reba, anytime her blood glucose is too high, then a lot of glucose also ends up in the filtrate during the filtration, right? During job number one. 
there's so much glucose then in the filtrate that sometimes if it's too high, she doesn't have enough carrier proteins to reabsorb it all. And so glucose is lost in the urine. So this is one of the ways that we actually diagnose diabetes. Normally, there should be zero glucose in your urine. There should not be any glucose in your urine. Your kidneys should be able to reabsorb it all. And so one of the things that happens as a symptom of uncontrolled diabetes and high blood sugar is that people who are in that state will actually end up losing weight oftentimes because they end up peeing out their nutrients that they're eating right because their blood glucose levels are so high it kind of seems kind of strange they also will pee more than usual because glucose is osmotically active and will pull water also out into the filtrate along with it so uh, a very classic symptom of poorly controlled diabetes or undiagnosed diabetes untreated diabetes and therefore high blood glucose levels is polyuria making lots of urine and glucose urea right so glucose in the urine so if somebody's peeing a lot and there's glucose in the urine and especially if they're losing weight uh, diabetes is very high in the list of potential diagnoses so in summary we've talked about the first two jobs filtration and reabsorption filtration is when we form the filtrate right so we generate some pressure in those glomerular capillaries which squeezes out uh, plasma and small solutes from the bloodstream into Bowman's capsule and that becomes our filtrate or our nascent urine our baby urine some of the small solutes in plasma of course still stay back behind in the blood right um, so we need to remember that but a lot of them move out into the filtrate so then since some of the things that moved into the filtrate are things we actually wanted to keep then job number two is reabsorption so we're going to get on that right away we're going to move glucose and amino acids back from the filtrate back into the bloodstream in those peritubular capillaries because we don't want to lose it. We are also going to reabsorb some sodium. And because we're moving these against their concentration gradient, because we want them all in the blood and none in the filtrate, this is active transport, which is going to require carrier proteins. So we'll pick up with jobs three and four in part two or part B of lecture 34.